them and for how to do more. So, I'm going to cover these five topics. The first is, what do we know about social media? I'm going to summarize social media, provide suggestions, you know, help clarify it. And then I'm going to talk about dialogue. Um, we, we often assume people understand dialogue, but they just know the word. They don't know what it means. So the second part will cover dialogue. The third is to talk about um, dialogue uh, in the way it's been studied in the past. So the old dialogue. There's a lot of research on dialogue, and uh, I'm going to summarize briefly some of the assumptions. And then, fourth, what is the new public relations dialogue? We'll try to look at some uh, more context for contemporary dialogue, what we should do. And then the last, how do dialogue and social media integrate? Try to bring them together. Okay. Understanding the World Wide Web and social media. You probably know most of this, some of this, but for, to start with, okay, the internet. The internet's a big database, okay, it's essentially a, a big, um, a big storehouse of information, right, a filing cabinet filled with files, you know, um, uh, I don't have a metaphor for it. Uh, but the internet is the place where all the data is stored, okay? And then the web is the interface. And Young to appreciate this, remember this, but a GUI, graphic user interface, okay? Uh, the web is essentially an interface, just as a tool we use to get access to what's on the internet. So, the internet, big database, the web is an interface that we use. And Web 1.0, the first version of the internet, um, you were, uh, most of you were just a few years old, okay, or just born. First version of the web, many years ago, um, when, I was, when I was in college, when I was a graduate student, the web was just text. There were no pictures, there were no uh, hyperlinks, I mean, there were some. So when I used the web for research, I could type words in and see more words, but um, my browser was just a text browser. No pictures. Okay? Then Web 2.0. And Web 2.0, uh, the metaphor here, okay? Web 1.0 is a library. Web 1.0 brings you to books and information. And Web 2.0 it's a party at the library, okay? So you're at the library, you're with your friends, you're having fun. And then Web 3.0, even better, okay? Web 3.0 is a surprise party at the library. So you come to the library, your friends invite you to the library, and you show up and they're having a party just for you, okay? So you have this sort of metaphor, this progression of how we think about the Internet from just a, a database, Web 1.0, Books. Web 2.0, you know, a party with books, which some people don't like. And Web 3.0, even better, okay? Now, Web 3.0 also has risks. So on your smartphones, you have apps, all those little, you know, buttons you can download. You can download a program that lets you do something, order a taxi cab, um, you know, uh, 
talk to your friends. So you have these apps. When you download an app, you give it permission to look at your data. Okay? So this idea of identity theft, loss of privacy, that's a big risk. Okay? With Web 3.0, your phone knows where you are. We've used people's location data to catch criminals. When they're driving in their cars, we can track them. Um, when you go through a toll booth in the U.S., we have a, a, a device some people can get, an electronic device, that pays your fee when you drive through the toll booth. I'm not sure if you have toll booths here. In, some, probably, right? Uh, we have a few places in the U.S., not many, but uh, we have, in New Jersey, where I live, there were uh, <coughs> 10 lanes of traffic going one direction and 10 lanes of traffic going the other direction. And uh, every 10 miles, you had to stop and pay a toll. So the traffic slowed down. It was terrible. But if you had this Easy Pass, this device, you could pay your toll immediately. But every time you went through the toll booth, someone knew where you were. Okay? And your phone, of course, tracks you, and everyone can know where you are. And smartphones can't be shut off. So even though you power your smartphone down, someone can still track you. Government official, you know, a police agency. So you're not completely safe in terms of uh, private information. And there's much more, but this is just the basics. So the web is really nice, it's fun, it lets you do these things. You connect to friends, you have a good time, you get to uh, easily access information. But, you give away information, okay. which takes us then to some of the details, understanding the World Wide Web and social media. You know, I don't have to tell you this, you already know, social media is this you know, sort of interactive event. You communicate with your friends, they communicate with you. Social media won what we call sort of the early social media tools. In the beginning, in the beginning was social media one, and you can call it anything you want. Intro to social media, basic social media. When social media started, it was just about sharing information. And then these tools evolved. Designers found ways to make them more enticing. <laughs> And we come to something called Web 2.0, where organizations started using social media. In the, in the early days of the web, people studied how to make it more effective. Uh, you, have a, you have a service like Amazon.com. Uh, what's it called? Okay, well. But they said, you say a lot of from me. I don't hear very well. Uh, Amazon.com is a sales site. And you have, say it loud for them. Okay, you all know what I'm talking about. Make sure quick. Um, when they first started this, they tried, does a red button make people more likely to buy something? Does a green button make someone more likely to buy something? You know, if we put the button over here, does it make you more likely to buy something? If I put the button down here, does it make you more likely to buy something? So there was all these experiments that tried to learn how to manipulate you, how to get you to spend money. And the same is true of social media. Social media, uh, the research that guides social media is the same research that in many ways goes into uh, uh, Pavlov, you know, uh, Conditioning, classical conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning. Do you, do you have a translation for Pavlov for me? All right, well, um, the, the research was, the early research sought to find ways to, um, to stimulate your brain when you did something that you liked. So the like button, when you say like, and a hundred of your friends like something that you post, that, that makes you feel good, that stimulates you. And since there's a reward, you want to stay. Is this clear? Okay. And so, 
uh, in the beginning, we shared information with other people. Then we said, organizations said, how can we sell stuff? How can we make it a better tool for selling them things? And so we put advertisements here, and we designed the sites for advertisers. So now the sites aren't run for your entertainment. You think they're run for your entertainment. You enjoy them. You have fun. You connect with your friends. But they only exist right now because an advertiser can use it to sell you something. Because if there was no money in advertising, people wouldn't support it. It costs millions, billions of dollars to run these sites. Electricity, support, you know, people to make them function. That wouldn't be free. So advertising enables you to have social media. And we make social media so enticing, so fun, that you want to come back. Okay. Now, there's two metaphors I want to talk about for this. The first metaphor, we talked about this the other night. There were some questions about this. Uh, Orwell's Big Brother versus Huxley's Brave New World. There's a... Okay, so there's a discussion of this, uh, both of these concepts, uh, in this book by Postman. There's a book by Postman called Amusing Ourselves to Death. I'll put it on the board. And uh, this is one metaphor, okay? Brave New World versus Big Brother. Big Brother said, government is going to be watching you. Government's going to know what you do. Government's going to be spying on you. We have cameras. We have cameras somewhere right now. All over the place. Okay? There we go. Camera over there. Um, Big Brother was watching you. That was the metaphor. And this was from uh, uh, before the book was published. So the book was called 1984. And Postman said, oh, by, or not Postman, uh, uh, or, Orwell, said, by 1984, you know, we'll have these computers be watching us and we'll be under surveillance. Uh, Postman said, nah, no, I, th I think there's a better metaphor. This is a thing called an oubliette. It's a French word. And an oubliette is essentially, it's a dungeon. It's a hole. Okay, oubliette actually literally just means like hole. Uh, it's just a hole they threw you into to die. And you were put into the oubliette and people never saw you again. Okay, so you were imprisoned and no one expected you to come back. This wasn't like, you know, like a, like a one-year sentence. This was a death sentence. But the metaphor is good because when you're in the hole, right, it's, it, you, you want this information streaming in. So this other metaphor about the brave new world, Postman says, is a better metaphor because it's not that we're being watched. It's that you want to be watched. Okay? Every one of you has a smartphone. You all have apps to communicate with your friends. Many people, probably, you probably on average have 50 or more apps on your phone. And probably all of those know where you are. All right? Do you have any idea who owns them, who runs them, who controls them? Right? You have no idea. You just have a fun app. Someone tells you, oh, this is a good app. I can get a cab with it. So you download it. You don't know who owns it. But they know where you are. And they, can, they know when you go to breakfast, they know when you go to lunch, they know when you go to dinner, they know where you shop, they know where you buy you know, food, they know where you, uh, what kind of clothing you like to purchase. You're tracked. So the second metaphor, this, this is a better metaphor. Because you're asking to be watched. You're giving away your freedom in exchange for fun. Okay? As opposed to this, where, oh, you know, I'm, I don't want to be watched, you know, they're watching me, that's bad. But this is like, eh, you know, okay. Yeah. It's not so bad. Okay. So, for me, okay, so for me, uh, dialogue is something that I think can help us do more with social media. And uh, first, I want to make sure we're clear about dialogue. What is it? How does it work? I think I covered some of this last month the other night. I don't recall now. This is lecture six, so I'm losing track. Uh, 
The word dialogue. Let me just check this a second. Okay. The word dialogue has this sense of just talk. So I'm having a dialogue with you. Okay? And that's one sense of the word dialogue. But since I'm the only one talking, technically it's not a dialogue. Okay? We call that a monologue. It's just me giving you a speech. And you're sitting there. In order to have a dialogue, we need to have more. So we need to have these factors. We need to have trust. We need to have risk. Presence, which I'll explain. Self-disclosure. A willingness to be changed. And be willing to admit when you're wrong. Now, some of you are nervous about your language skills. Okay? So you don't want to, you know, speak out and have a conversation. So when I ask a question, you probably understand me. Many of you do. Many, many might not. But you don't want to, you know, say something. You're shy. You know, you don't want to, uh, you don't want people watching you. Okay? So you're not yet willing to trust. So we could have a, we could talk. But it's not dialogue because there's not enough trust yet. And in order for there to be trust, there has to be risk. You have to be willing to uh, say something, even though you might be nervous. So the other night, many people asked questions, and even though people were nervous, they got up, they asked their question, they, they, they had it answered, and that's, you know, that's rewarding. You feel good. You asked your question, you got to get a response. Even when it's not what you want, you can go home and say, I hate to understand anything I said, you know. Um, but, you know, you still got to ask your question, right? So we had this exchange. So we had, uh, we had some risk, and maybe, you know, maybe you built some trust. And then we have this presence, this idea of presence. Presence means we have to spend time together. If you meet someone you like, um, a man, a woman, you know, someone you want to make friends with, it doesn't have to be, a, a, you know, an intimate relationship, but just friends, um, to make a friend, you have to spend time with someone. You have to you go have coffee with them, or tea with them, or a beer with them, whatever's appropriate. Uh, you might uh, uh, go to a club, or watch a movie. You spend time at the library. You, know, you spend time together. And if you like someone, it doesn't matter what you do with them. Because you're just, you get to spend the time with them. You enjoy them. They're fun. So, we have this presence, and to make a strong friendship, you have to have that. You probably have friends from when you were children that have been friends for most of your life, and you've spent it, you know, hundreds, thousands of hours with these people. You meet someone in class, you're not going to be as close as someone you've known your whole life. So presence is part of this dialogue. Self-disclosure, willingness to share information, so you tell someone something about yourself, they tell you something about them, and you share some information, self-disclosure. And then willingness to be changed is when um, uh, we often, uh, I don't know if, they, if you've ever seen this here, in the U.S. they've had sh game shows where they'll take, uh, they'll take ten men over here, and they'll take ten women over here, and you have to match up, you know, like the husband and the wife together. And you can. People who live together for, for 20 years, they start dressing alike, they start looking alike, they start, they have similar mannerisms, things they do, they, you know, they're similar. And that's true of people who are our friends. We, we, we have things in common with them. We build this rapport with them. Uh, I had a friend in college who, when you, when you asked him a question and he was thinking, he would, he would do this. He would. So, we, we would tease him. You know, we would say, what do you think? You know, we'd ask him a question and then we... And uh, at first we were just, you know, teasing him. Uh, it was like a joke. But by the end of the year, you know, people would ask us a question and we'd be like, I don't know. So, you know, you pick up these mannerisms. Uh, figures of speech, the ways you talk. And so um, that's part of this willingness to be changed, to accept, you know, to learn from other people, to have them influence you. And then the last is this idea of admitting when you're wrong. Uh, 
being able to say, you know, I made a mistake. Being able to say, um, uh, this is not the best course of action. So a company wants to build a new apartment building somewhere, and they, if they ask people what they think, people will say, you know, maybe, no, we don't want this apartment building here, we want something else. Um, so if they don't ask, they can just build the apartment building. But if they ask people and they say, we don't want it, okay, so you've got risk, of course, and trust, and willingness to be changed. But if they're not willing to admit they're wrong, right, it's easier just not to ask. Why ask? Just do it. And then, too bad. So if they ask and they find out, people say, that's a bad idea and here's why. And they think about it and they realize, huh, that's a bad idea. We should put our building somewhere else. Okay, well that's a dialogic process. It, you know, it takes into account what people say. It doesn't assume you know everything's right. What's common, this was part of what happened in, uh, in Turkey, what's common is that developers or the government sometimes wants to destroy a public place like a park or a uh, open space or a place for people to get together and they want to use it for something else that no one wants except someone to make money but most people don't want that and so a company wants to destroy a park to build a golf course the golf course will be only for wealthy people, only for a small number of people. So thousands suffer, so a few hundred can enjoy themselves. Well, no one wants that. So if you ask people, they'll say, no, we, don't, we, don't, we want to have the park. And so if you're using dialogue, your organization has to be willing to engage in this process and realize sometimes that they can't have their way. Sometimes what they want is wrong. Okay. So the last is that this is an ethical uh, orientation towards communication. It's ethical, more ethical than other things, because we try to get people's opinion. We don't, we don't control them just because we can. We try to encourage them to have input. We try to build a relationship with them. It's about relationship building and trust. Okay. It was developed by lots of people, philosophers, um, scholars, feminist scholars, political scientists, people from all sorts of areas. One of the reasons we say it's, it's ethical, it's more ethical, is just because so many people agree that it's ethical. Okay, people from, people from, people from many areas see this as the case. Uh, the second is that it revolves around trusting co-creation of reality. Co-creation of reality is when you spend time with someone else and you start seeing the world how they see it. They start seeing the world how you see it. And um, I can guess. So there's a, a research, there's a research tool. I have a button. I put the screen up and down when I'm doing this in my class. Is there a button around here? I can put this up. Okay. Uh, there's a research tool where we ask people, okay, we ask people to identify, to sort of identify what they think themselves. And this is, this is what the people think. Then we ask them what another group thinks. They, you know, what does this group think about this? And there's this space where you guess, okay? I think this. I think they think this. And we do this all the time. You guess at what people mean. Then we ask, what do you think they think you think? Okay? That's much harder. And there's only a very small overlap. Because we sometimes think people, you know, maybe they don't like me, or maybe we think they do like us, and it turns out they don't like us. Or we think that they think, you know, uh, I think, that's a good point. Um, so professors, we, we think students all think we're, you know, we're very studious and we're hardworking and, you know, we care about uh, education and teaching. And uh, I, I tell students sometimes, I say, you know, you know, that's true, but, you know, we also work nine months a year. You know, we have three months off in the summer. 
I get a month off at the holiday, you know, at year end. I get a week off each semester as a break. So um, I care about learning and education, sure, but I also like having four months off a year. And so uh, this is called co-orientation. This is where you, by understanding the other person, this area can get bigger. You know, this area of where you know this, you, th you know, they think this, they think you think this. We start building, we start co-creating, we make this bigger. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So we've got this idea of uh, co-creation, we've got this idea of trust, and then two-way communication and interactivity. This has to be two-way and it has to be interactive. Okay? Now, just being interactive in one way is uh, you send a message, maybe they read it, I mean, that's better than nothing, but it's not dialogue. Okay? So we have to have two-way and we have to have interactivity. Uh, I don't remember if I talked about it here, but I had this uh, in my class one semester, well, I've done this many times, I had students who were nervous and didn't want to participate. And so, uh, I, I, uh, it's a graduate class, so I only have, uh, you know, maybe 10 students, not 100 students. And uh, every student must participate. So I have a clock that counts down two minutes. And I start the clock. you got two minutes, okay? And you got to tell me what you think. you got two minutes to tell me what you think. And then it's your turn. Clock dings. you got to stop. Two minutes, you have to you, you stop talking. It's your turn, okay? And you've got to, you can comment on what she said, you can bring up something completely new, or you can ask some question that you want answered of somebody else. And then your two minute ends, we come, and it's your turn, and we start the clock, and, and I get two minutes too. You can, I mean, sometimes I talk longer, but uh, everybody gets two minutes. And when we get to the end, we start over again. And what it means is everybody must participate. You, you can't sit there and be silent. You can't, uh, if you don't understand something, you have to ask. If you disagree, you know, you have to say something, you have to express it. And so, of course, for it to work, there has to be some, you know, trust, those other things. So people are nervous at first, they're not sure what to do, and we work into it. But after a few weeks, people get really good at it. And we start, you know, more questions are asked, more issues are raised. So it's just a tool that we use for this interactivity, to have this interactive environment. Okay, there are more, there are dozens of principles of dialogue, but these are the basics, okay? Five basics that I laid down many years ago from some research and said, here are the basic principles of dialogue. The first is mutuality. And we've already talked about all of these, or most of these in a little bit of detail. Mutuality, the recognition that organizations, uh, the, of an organization to public relationship. That symbol means to. CNL, most people, most of my students don't know what that means. And so uh, that dash means to, so organization to public. Uh, if it was a numbers of a page, pages 100 to 200, it would be 100 dash 200, which means 100 to 200. So, organization to public relationships, mutuality. The second is propinquity. And I'll add a little bit more in a second. Propinquity is a, is a difficult word, and it's a very uncommon word. I, I've never met someone who said it on purpose. Um, but it's a very descriptive word because it has to do with this temporality and spontaneity. Propinquity, propinquity means nearness. Okay, so you can build a relationship with someone you've never met. But it's a lot easier to do if they're in the same room, or if they're in the same town, or if they're in the same area. So, mutuality, propinquity, empathy. Empathy is different than sympathy. So somebody falls down and you feel bad, that's sympathy. Uh, somebody falls down and you know what it's like to fall down, you did the same thing and it hurt a lot. That's empathy, okay? I have this piece of glass on my finger that I need to have removed. It's a long story. But uh, it only hurts once in a while. And you can feel bad that, oh, too bad he has glass in his finger. That must hurt. 
Uh, but unless you have had some experience where you've had some some pain, some injury that was you know ongoing, and you always were you know aware of it, eh, it's hard to hard to empathize. You, know, you can guess. Okay, so empathy is made better by propinquity, by spending more time with someone, by self-disclosure, by trust, by risk. So those earlier factors are part of this process. And then risk, we've already talked about that in great detail. And then number five is commitment, or the extent to which an organization you know, gives itself over to dialogue and understanding. So, an organization like we talked about, so the organization wants to build this apartment building, and if they ask people, they could say no. But an organization that's dedicated to trying to do it ethically, you know, an organization that wants to build the relationships, is willing to take the risk, and is willing to learn from the people involved, and isn't just going to quit when it's over. So they're going to build these relationships with people who are relevant, uh, townspeople or whatever, and then they will go back to them. And they will consult them again about other issues. They don't just use them strategically. You don't just use them and then never contact them again. You have to have that commitment to the ongoing relationship. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but I, I've jumped ahead. So dialogue can mean both talk, sort of, um, you know, just a technical experience, uh, but it can also be something more complicated. So you have this meaning of, uh, of two different kinds of dialogue here. I'll let Sam get for me, right? Kaigui and Daihua. Uh, what is it? Okay. Say it again. Okay. Daihua. And how do I say the first one? Kaigui. Oh, it wasn't that bad the first time. Okay, so, but anyway, my understanding, is a very nice article by uh, this scholar about this from 1999, he talks about how these are just different senses of the word, and one of them is very different, right? So one of them is just this, this sort of dialogue, this meeting, we get this from government officials, they give speeches, they tell us what they think, and then the other one is more of a conversation, more of an exchange, where you participate, and uh, it matters what you say, or that you're part of it. And so, uh, both of these, you know, they're both dialogue, essentially, right? They're both synonyms for the word, but they're completely different, very different activities. I have a this colleague who does this uh, training on video, and he has the microphone already, and you're going, oh, 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 oh. breathing means I hate it, but, so I'm sorry, but working with the microphone here. Darth Vader. Okay, so language, dialogue, language, and culture. There's a little more to it. You kind of got the basics. Actually, let me just jump back real quick, all right? So we've got the you know, mutuality, propinquity, empathy, risk, commitment. These are sort of the basics. And then it's more than just talk. It's sort of this... Uh, strategic uh, effort to get to know someone to be you know fair and honest with them and then we get to dialogue you know some more about dialogue dialogue shuns power so a truly dialogic organization or person is um, not going to be manipulative is not going to try to just get what they want they're going to want you to participate and um, we know that there are different status relationships in different cultures. So in some, you know, elders get more respect and they're supposed to be treated with more respect because they're older. And then in some cultures, people with certain, you know, uh, training or education, teachers, professors, are seen, you know, with, um, are, should be treated with more respect. And of course then we have, you know, things like supervisors and relationships to bosses. So we've got these different kinds of power relationships. And a dialogic organization, a dialogic communicator, will try to minimize those. Uh, so it gets tricky in certain ways, like a parent-child relationship, okay? 
parents have a responsibility to make sure the children behave well and you know go to school and work hard and become good citizens. And so, of course, you can like your children and be friends with them, and you undoubtedly have a dialogic relationship with your parents, in spite of the fact that there probably will always be a power dynamic. Okay? So my advisor from when I went to school, he will always be, you know, even though status-wise I have the same job that he has, he's my advisor. He will always be my advisor. You know, I will always treat him with respect. So you can have a dialogic relationship, and you can have power, but the organization or the person doing it has to work hard so that power isn't the overriding factor. Okay? Getting people to participate or getting people to be part of it. So it's relational, not strategic. You don't build relationships because you want them to do something for you. You build relationships because being ethical, building relationships, brings more information to you, enriches your life, helps you understand members of your organization, and so it's good for you and it's good for them. And we talked about time, it takes time, it takes trust, it requires this, this process, and it can't be quantified. One of my students actually wrote an article um, um, several years ago that uh, I'm a co-author on with her, and she did some research and she argues that uh, oh, we can reduce dialogue to three principles. We don't need, you know, two of those other two. We don't need trust and risk. We can just use these other three. And uh, the argument is just that if you're studying this quantitatively, we don't need all five principles. But this isn't a quantitative process. A relationship isn't something you can quantify, or at least you shouldn't quantify. You can quantify how many relationships you have. So if you look on your Facebook or on your uh, social media sites that you have, you can count how many friends you have, and it tells you how many friends you have on your on your Renren site or whatever. And you can say, oh look, I have 500 friends. Okay, but that's not. Um, the same relationship. You don't have a dialogue with all of them. Some of them you barely know, some of them you know better, etc. So uh, you can't simply say it's only these first three or these first two. So this brings us to what I said earlier, the old dialogic public relations. When people started studying dialogue, they looked at something we call uh, the potential for dialogue. So I put together a list many years ago and I said these are the things you need to do to have the potential for dialogue on the internet. Not long after the internet was invented, uh, before most social media existed, I looked at it and came up with this list of principles where I said if you want to build dialogue, here's what you can do. And for the next 15 years, people have studied it, they still do this, and they say, um, uh, Twitter or whatever social media is dialogic because I say something and they say something. Okay? And if you look at that list of words, that's not dialogue. Dialogue isn't you say something, they say something. That's not dialogue. That's two way. And that's an exchange of information. But it's not clearly a dialogic relationship. So, right? It's not, it's not in this area. It's just uh, talk. So, social media are assumed to be dialogic. That's one of the assumptions that, that some scholars make. And then, um, if it's social media, they assume that it's dialogic. So, they go together. They go hand in hand. And then the third is this idea that um, dialogic potential and dialogue, they're the same thing, which, I, which I've already spoken of. But this is the mistake. So, if we had, a, if we were going to have a dialogue, first you have to have the potential, right? I mean, we have to come together, we have to have something to talk about, I have to be willing to, to tell you information and be honest, and you, of course, have to be willing to try to communicate with me. To have a dialogue, we have to first have the potential for dialogue. We have to be able to do that. And so the mistake is just thinking, though, that dialogic potential is a dialogue. Which it isn't. It's just we've set it up and there's a potential for it. Okay, a couple more things. That's part of the this old dialogue. And I think I just said this. Two-way communication is often confused with dialogue. 
So just because I say something and you say something back, if you think about your social media, you can post a message and your friends and colleagues might not get it for a long time. I have a cousin who, uh, who I invited to join my social media page a year ago. And like three days ago, he just wrote me back and said yes. Okay, and so just being there in, in the space, having a, a two-way channel isn't the dialogue. And there's a technical, technical kind of uh, two-way communication that you may or may not have learned about. It's not very important, it's just that um, symmetrical communication is this, uh, this process of two-way. It's talked about as a two-way process. But it's essentially the same thing. If it's, if it's just two-way, it's not dialogue. And then dialogue is procedural rather than relational. That's what the old assumption was. So by coming here and speaking to you and telling you what I think and then saying, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. And you ask me a couple questions and I go home and you never see me again. Okay? Uh, but I did it, right? I came here, I talked, I let you ask questions. Must be a dialogue. Okay? So there's more to it than that has to be relational, has to be, so maybe I go home and you contact me in a month with a question and I, you know, I answer your question, right, assuming I, in a month I'm going to be in New Zealand, so I might tell you that I'll answer your question in a couple weeks when I get home, but uh, you ask me a question, assuming I answer your question, and maybe we go back and forth, we have several discussions over the next, course of the next several months, and then maybe a year from now, you're interested in coming to the U.S. or something to get a master's degree and study in my school or got to get a Ph.D. someday or something. And I have a sense of who you are. We've built this relationship. I've gotten to know you. I have some idea about your uh, you know, intellectual abilities. I have some idea about your skills as a student. Okay, That's more than procedural. That's relational. So that's what you're shooting for. That's the ideal here. But the old dialogue says, you know, procedures enough. And then the last is that, the last mistake is that most people don't have a way of, of operationalizing or measuring dialogue. This is, it, it's clearly difficult. So we can't just count friends, that's not enough. And we can't just say, did you have a channel to communicate? That's not enough. And we can't just say, were you, uh, did you reduce uh, fear? And did you uh, uh, reduce the power dynamics? And that's not enough. But those are all good steps. That's dialogic potential. Okay, we're not there yet. But how you measure it's really hard. So you need to have had that exchange. When I review articles, I always say, did you, did, you, did you read what anybody said to each other? Because most research just counts messages. You know, the organization sent 10 messages, 20 people wrote them back, and they answered 10 of those people, and it's dialogue because there was a two-way communication channel. And I always say, did you read what they said? How do you know what they said? Just counting doesn't tell us. And so that's one of the problems is how do you operationalize it? So that brings us to the new dialogic public relations. And the idea of this is to say, if we're really going to have dialogue, here's what we need to do. First is this concept of unconditional positive regard for the other. Unconditional positive regard for the other means uh, this comes from a, uh, a psychologist named Rogers from about 40 years ago. And it was an article about how to help people. It's a, it's a counseling psychologist. And he said the first thing is to have something called unconditional positive regard for the other. And that just means that you're, uh, no matter like, who they are, where they come from, you know, what you might think of them, you make this effort to sort of treat them with respect, to treat them the same you would treat anybody else, to help them, to do something for them. The second is it requires interaction to be dialogue, which I've said about 50 times tonight. Okay, so you have to have this interactiveness. And the third is that, uh, there's more, but the third in this page is does not assume organizations are always correct. This is a big problem for a lot of people is the sense that organizations admit they're wrong, is the sort of risk of not knowing everything. And this goes back really a long time to uh, politics, where there's this idea 
that we frame as, you know, if they only knew what I knew. Okay, so the assumption of all politicians, um, when you have different parties or different groups, is that if they understood us, they'd believe, they'd know, right? It's just, I, I know the truth, and if they understood, they'd agree. And that's just silly, okay? That's just not the case. Some people completely don't agree with, you know, other people's views of the world, and just knowing what they believe doesn't make them believe it anymore. And so organizations really need to get past this idea they know everything. They're always right. Whatever they want, they should have. And realize that they'd make better decisions if they were more open to other possibilities. Okay. So more, to, more on that is working to co-create reality and build a shared vision. This is actually what I described here really is done. There are people who make a living doing this research. It's called co-creational research. And you could bring someone in to communicate with a group of people and ask them. It's a very big survey and you ask them a bunch of questions and you take the survey yourself and you try to understand how they see the world. So there are ways to do it with tools, with you know, research tools. But there's also building relationships with others. So working to co-create and build a shared vision. Assuming, assumes that people must be trained in dialogue. What I've described over the last hour is not something that's necessarily intuitive. Um, we all know that we probably know someone who makes friends more easily than we do. And you know, maybe we're sort of jealous that it's so easy for them to make friends and to you know and to build relationships with other people. And other people aren't as good at it. Well, this whole theory is based on interpersonal communication. And some people aren't good at it. Some people are really uncomfortable talking to other people, and it's not something they enjoy. And so, uh, for people to be good at this requires them to understand how do you do it. What's the process? What should I do? So training is part of this. We have to train people in this. The sixth, I think, the third on this sheet, dialogue should build social capital and make the world a better place. Organizations can do a lot more than they're doing, and it doesn't have to cost them money. If they'll make a commitment to share information of certain kinds. I think I, I, I didn't tell you this anecdote. I think I sort of alluded to it last time I was here. But I wanted, I asked Microsoft once why they had a default font for Microsoft Word. When you turn on Microsoft Word in the US, it's always this, this uh, typeface called Times New Roman. And it didn't used to be like that. When it first was invented, you could use any typeface you wanted for the default. So I wrote an email one night from Latvia when I was there. And I said, why, why Times? And it seems like, everyone, like why would anybody not answer that question? Why wouldn't you tell me? Uh, and I got back a message from one of the lawyers who told me, thank you for your question. Unfortunately, we're not able to provide you with that information at this time. And some other kind of legal garbage. And so uh, I was really unhappy because I'm thinking, you know, it, it, it's a font. I mean, how did you, why would this be secret? I mean, what could I do with this information? Um, I couldn't you know, harm the organization. I couldn't make any money from it. So uh, I contacted someone else and got some, you know, an answer to the question. But and, and I did some things like you know, I got angry and wrote her a nasty note too, which I should have done. But uh, anyway, the idea that dialogue should be used to make the world a better place, right? So we don't need to hide information about things that aren't important. We don't need to be afraid of every of sharing, you know, every bit of information. It's all not some sort of secret that we have to keep. And so part of this idea of you know, building social capital, you know, social capital is built when people build relationships. People who join churches, who are part of religious organizations or groups, right? Joining a church or joining a cause, that builds social capital. Becoming a member, you know, well, bowling, right? You have bowling here. You know, people who are in bowling leagues, they build social capital. They make the world a better place. People who uh, play, uh, what's it called, the uh, those things uh, work with me. The little tiles, what do you call that? The game of the little white tiles. Tiles, why not? 
Mahjong. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't think of it right there, right? Okay, that built social capital. You see? I have little prizes I could give for people who get the answer first. Um, I was going to bring something today and I could give to like the winner, but I didn't have anything in mind. Um, it seems trivial, but when we create these places, right, just where people can come together and spend time. In, in my graduate program in the U.S., we had, uh, I was in the Department of Communication, and in my department, no public space. And there wasn't a closet where you could, where you could be with another human being. I mean, we had hallways, and we had offices, but there was no place where people could come together. There's no shared space in a communication department. Across the hall, political science, okay, behind this like closed door. No one, you know, we didn't know what was back there because it wasn't our department. But, you know, like 10 feet away, you'd open the door. There was a big room, you know, almost as big as this, with like a TV and couches and free drinks. And it was for political science students, it wasn't for us. But, you know, they had this space where people could come, where people could sit, where people could talk. Like, I've got, you know, this little teacher's ready room across the hall here. Do you have one of those? It's like a student room where you can get together. And you get the classroom, but that's not the same. You know, is there a place where you can get together before class and talk? I, you, know, you don't have to answer, but I'm just saying, this, you know, little things, having a shared space, having a place where people can come together, these help make people feel closer to other people. They help make, you know, things better. They build social capital, we call that. Okay. Uh, steps for dialogue and social media. So what do we, how do we make this happen? I've been talking a little bit about this. Social media should be social. You can't be social with millions of people. So an organization who has, you know, 10 million members or, you know, we've got organizations uh, on, on Facebook in the U.S., Walmart has like 56 million members. Starbucks has 20 million members. I'm sure you've got organizations that have more here. Uh, so you have these organizations with these lists of sort of, you know, associations, but there's no relationship there. That's not a relationship. That's just a list of people. And so you need to find a way to make it genuinely social. So besides the list that you have with, you know, your, your, your friends, let's just say, say you start a list with your fellow students who have an interest in a particular topic. So it's just you and your friends who are interested in a certain thing. So let's just, it, it could be crisis communication. It could be risk communication. It could be, um, it could be uh, malicious advertising. It could be um, great advertising, right? But I mean, you could start this list with people that's not everyone you know. So it's a, a shared space that you create. An organization could do that where they brought in people who had an interest or an expertise or an awareness of a certain kind of issue. Um, in the U.S., gay and lesbian issues aren't, aren't new, but they're certainly something that many organizations are thinking about is what should their policies be. An organization could start a, a social media list with experts in an area, a particular area, a social area, a political area, okay? And so instead of having social media only as an advertising tool where we send out messages to people, we use that same tool to create this space where we bring people together and discuss ideas and talk about important things. Costs no money, wouldn't take a lot of extra time, the benefit to the organization could be enormous, could be extremely valuable in terms of learning about issues ahead of time. So, uh, making social media social, focusing on stakeholders uh, and public interests first, not just organizational interests. So, like I said, you don't build the relationships to exploit the people. You build the relationships because it's beneficial to them. Tomorrow I'm giving a talk about a research project I did using uh, a research method called the Delphi method. And in this method, you bring together as many experts as you can find on a particular topic. So it could be 60, it could be 80, usually it's more like 30 or 40, because you have, it's hard to find people to participate. But one of the things you do with this, with this research tool is the participants are the first to get the information. So it's not just you, the organization, You're, you don't just exploit them for this information. 
They help you develop answers to questions. They help you find information you might not have known. And everybody gets it. Everybody in that organization, the group, everybody who participates in the study, gets the information before anybody else in the world. Imagine, right, the value of, of that, you know, and this is a research tool, but imagine that you had a social media space with a collection of people with some expertise on new technology or some expertise in whatever it was, some advertising area or journalism, whatever it was. And these people, you know, they, these people, um, the people you select, right, it shouldn't just be people that do something for you. I mean, if you're going to build this relationship, this is going to be valuable to them too. But the people that you select get something from it because they have then insight from other colleagues they might not normally interact with. Them. And you have the potential to get information that other people wouldn't have ahead of time. Uh, being able to mine social media can be a very valuable tool, but it's very time consuming for one person to do, but by bringing it together with a group of experts, you get more out of it. So, um, focus on stakeholder public interests first, uh, and then the last, public spaces and collective decision making needs to be revived. As I mentioned, you know, many, many organizations and places don't have a lot of public space where things can happen together. Uh, and we change that. We start working to bring people together to encourage people to participate. And we use social media uh, as a way of doing that. But again, not by having a thousand members of your social media circle, not by having 10,000, by having 10 circles with 20 people in it. And so that, that is more work, but if all your time wasn't spent working on one social media tool with, with 5 million people, it was also, you know, instead you had someone who devoted their energy to these smaller groups of people who had, a, you know, an, an interest in something, that's a valuable, uh, that has more value to the organization. It's not an advertising tool, though. Okay, so uh, for revising the role of organizational council rather than uh, Weibo or in chief, Twitter in chief. So in the U.S., this is common for many public relations, young public relations professionals, is we want them to be social media experts. And what we really mean by that is they're just going to like send out messages on social media. They don't do research on social media. They don't find ways to use it more effectively. The organization doesn't care that they might know something about how to do more with it in general. They just want to hire them to send out messages because they're the right age or the right you know, ethnicity or they have the right background to be able to connect with somebody. And so they have this very simple, trivial job of just sort of sending out and posting messages that doesn't require a whole lot of thought. And we need to stop that because it doesn't. we don't need it. I mean, Advertising already has people who specialize in trying to reach people with their messages and teach skills in doing that. And for my purposes, public relations should, be, should do more. Focus on the long term, not the short term. There's a concept called the long term orientation, originally uh, the long term orientation, or Confucianism that comes from a, a Dutch scholar named Geert Hofstede. And Hofstede said that, uh, that he did research uh, at multinational corporations and companies and organizations all over the United States, uh, all over the world. Um, and um, what he learned was that there's these you know, different kinds of cultural you know, behaviors that we see in different countries. One of them is, is this concept of power or distance. He calls it how people see people in power. Uh, and then another important one is this idea of the long-term orientation, of seeing the big picture, seeing farther down the road, not just tomorrow. And so this idea of the long-term orientation is sort of this dialogue, very dialogic idea, and it can be very valuable. And then um, uh, sixth one is having transparent rules. So people who participate in this dialogue, they know what they get out of it. They know what the expectation is. They know what will be shared and what won't be shared. If they don't like what won't be shared, they can say that should be shared. Let's talk about sharing that. That should be kept private. Organizations, you know, like as you know, 
working guest, right? Having grown up in any country with the you know government, you know the government makes ideas and has policies and, and acts changes, and they almost never ask individuals, right? Occasionally, people are consulted. Occasionally, there's votes on issues, but in general, things are done, and nobody asks you if it's a good idea. So having transparent rules is crucial because you're not dealing with 10,000 people or a million people. You're dealing with 20 people, and everyone should know what's expected, and everybody can make decisions. Okay, uh, another suggestion, learning to use analytic data and big data better. Big data is that kind of data that we're gathering about people, what they do, where they go, where they eat, all that kind of information we gather with your technology. And experts are saying this will become part of everything. Okay, So the new version of the web that's in the works right now will, uh, it's called the semantic web, web 3.0, I didn't talk about that much earlier. The, the new version of the web will anticipate your needs and it will try to give people what it thinks they want. And it will do this by mining your data, your personal information. And so um, we need to learn to do more with it. Not to, you know, to be exploited, but we need to know how is it being used, what can be done with it, you know, how can we use it effectively. And then analytic data is data that's gathered about usability. If you come to a website, you click on a link, you click here, you click here, that's analytic data and the websites track that. So uh, many people know how to make themselves anonymous when they're online, so people can't track them as easily. But um, my computer, for example, any computer, I can still track if you clicked on a link. I may not know who you are, where you're from, you know, where your uh, computer originates, but I know if someone clicked on a link. And whether someone clicked on a link can tell me about whether something's important to people or whether I should do something more with it. So there's a lot of important information in analytics that can still be learned and used. Moving away from one-way marketing and advertising to social media use, I, uh, as I said, um, advertising is great, great tool, marketing, useful tool, but advertising and marketing and public relations have different bodies of research, have different beliefs about the world. And when we do the same thing, when PR is just advertising and marketing, why do I need PR? Or why do I need advertising? Or why do I need marketing? You know, if it's all just one thing and it's all the same, then there is no advertising, marketing, and PR. It's just communicating for organizations' benefit. And so public relations professionals need to be able to do more than just be advertisers. And then the last would be learning. I think it's the last. Very close to the last. Really close, really close to the last. Learning how to foster participation in build small communities, not millions. I've already mentioned this half a dozen times, so it doesn't have to be about the big numbers. It can do more with better groups of people. Paying more attention to ethics, privacy, and personality formation. I, I've tried to get on some of your social media, and I think I told you this the other night, I don't have a smartphone. I just have this you know, sort of primitive phone from bygone era. And so I can't get on some of it and use it to look at it in close detail. But, so I'll use a US example, but I'm absolutely sure you've got exactly the same thing happening here. Children who grew up with the internet, okay, so people, who've, people who are in their early 20s now, um, who've had their internet, most have had internet most of their life, and in our case, you know, social media has only been, well, in all your cases, social media has been around since the um, late 90s, early, no, early 2000s, I guess, right? So since the early 2000s, so we're only looking at about a decade for social media, uh, but the generation that's coming up, and then also people in your age group, You've lived most of your life with social media, or a lot of your life with social media. And so, students that I have, I mean, everything they've ever done is on Facebook. And they've got these friends on their Facebook site from, from high school, and from grade school, from primary school. You know, these friends they've had their whole life are on their Facebook page. And uh, I don't know how much this is true here, but in the U.S., lots of people don't like grade school and high school. You know, they're glad when it ends. I hated it. And so um, I have no interest in any of the people I grew up with. I mean, I have no, I mean, I have two or three friends, but people I went to school with, I have no interest in seeing them. I don't have them on my social media pages, right? But if you grew up 
with social media. And if your friends have been part of your life when you were 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, and you're now in your mid-20s or maybe you're 30, and let's say something bad happens, okay? Let's just say something really dramatic. I knew a guy, I didn't really know him, he went to my school. He robbed a bank, and I opened the newspaper, and I saw that he'd been arrested, and he was going to prison, okay? Very bad, right? Uh, okay, now, if your entire life is this open book, everyone you ever knew, everyone you ever met, knows you went to prison, okay? There's no people not seeing the story. There's no people not knowing about it. And then how do you move forward with your life and do something afterwards? I mean, how do you recover? So it doesn't have to be something like prison. Something trivial can happen. You break up with a girlfriend or boyfriend or, or something else, but you lose a job. And your life is this open book that everyone has access to forever, which is where we're going. Social media never disappears. Everyone knows you forever, okay? And it's very common for people to want to remake themselves. I have friends who changed their name when they got older, you know, on, on, you know, were advised that it would be luckier to have a different name. One of my colleagues from graduate school changed his name, and, you know, I, I try to use his new name, but, you know, I never knew him under his new name. I don't even know him by his old name. But he made this decision to do this. People do things with their life, and so this is the point here, this personality formation. Social media are playing this much bigger role in how people make sense of the world. It's not trivial. It's not something we can ignore. And we don't really understand the effects, the implications. What will it mean that all this data, all this information is there forever? It's always there. And move it a step further. So what happens to the organization that makes a mistake? Lots of organizations, uh, they have an accident or an explosion or somebody tampers with a product or something. And that is there forever. There's this record of the organization having made a mistake forever. It's perpetually shared, perpetually advanced, sent to people generation after generation, you know, year after year. And so this is a super important issue that almost nobody thinks about, is what is the impact of this on people and their personality development and how they see the world. And then look farther down the road, 10 years. I've already mentioned it's not 10 months. Learn to use social media for research and to make predictions and better decisions. I think what I've described are sort of tools, research ideas, strategies that are much more than simply sending out advertising type messages, sending out one-way messages about things. You can do more with it. Using social media for their intended purpose, learn to use them for communication purposes. So the vision, the dream of social media was to connect people, was to help people come together and interact. That's what we should do with it. You can still do all that other stuff. You can still use it for marketing and advertising for those diehard people who think organizations should be able to do that. Of course, they'll never stop, okay? But it, why not do more too? Why not do more with it? Okay, so really, I'm almost done. So why dialogue? The question would be, why dialogue? What if we do nothing? What will happen? If we ignore this, if we pay no attention to this, why should we care? And I think this is a, makes a good point. The average life expectancy of a multinational corporation, Fortune 500 or its equivalent, is between 40 and 50 years. 40% of all the newly created, I'll come back, 40% of all the newly created companies last less than 10 years, and the average life expectancy of all firms, regardless of size, is only 12.5 years. Okay, I've seen it happen to corporations that seemed monstrously big, could never fail. I've seen it happen a half a dozen times since I've been alive. You'll see this happen over and over again. Corporations will merge, corporations will fail, their industries will die out, they'll become something else, they'll have to transform or they'll die. And we know that smaller organizations face this. So my point is, if all we do is what we've always done, this will never change. And the organization you work for you know, it will, some of them will disappear, and you'll have to go find a new job when that happens. I've actually friend that happened to three times. Uh, the company you worked for disappeared or merged or turned into something else. Um, but the point is simply that if all we do is the same, then of course we expect the same thing to happen. We need to do more. We have the potential to do more with this than simply what we've always done. So these are the last four. I think the big issue, social media should be social. I've said that. 
Dialogue should be dialogic, not just pretend dialogue one way. Technology is changing how we relate to other people, which is about personality issues and other kinds of things. Technology is changing how the world works. And, uh, you know, the problems we face can't be resolved by doing nothing or waiting for the government to act. I think. Um, okay. There you go. And we should make a little bit of place.